who will be doing an intro to Docker talk. Uh, please uh, give him a hand, and let's get it started. Thank you. Um, hello, everyone. Welcome to the uh, introductory talk on Docker. Um, as Carlos mentioned, my name is Amjith. I go by Amjith R on Twitter. But um, so I work for a company called New Relic, and uh, <clears throat> we use Docker in many internal projects. I'm going to explain a very specific example where we use it and how we solve this particularly hairy problem. But more on that latter. Um, I want to set the stage for. Why do we want to learn about Docker? Why is it important? Why is it worth your time? So let's get started by explaining a typical web stack. It, you, know, you have your uh, front-end server, Apache, Nginx, and your back-end server, like Unicorn, UWSGI, or uh, ModWSGI. Uh, and then you run Django on top of that. It's not, it doesn't stop right there. I mean, you have your database, which could be Postgres, MySQL, and then your caching layer, and your background task manager, and you know, if you are a New Relic customer, then you have New Relic to monitor all of these different pieces. Um, <coughs> if, you have, if, you, if you happen to be a full stack developer, you could be modifying any of these layers. And come deployment time, you check everything, you run your unit tests, everything works great, you run it on your local machine to make sure that you, know, you haven't uh, broken anything. And everything looks great, you look, feel confident, and then you start rolling out your deploy. Half an hour later, you find out that none of your customers are able to pay, so you hurriedly roll everything back and then you know, try to start debugging. And that can be anywhere from looking at log files to trying to reproduce your production environment by you know, exactly matching the minor version of your Nginx to Django and, and trying to recreate the problem. And you know, like half a day later, you find out that there is an environment variable that you forgot to set in the production environment. Um, does that sound familiar to anyone at all? Oh, good. I'm not the only one. <laughs> um, so Docker is supposed to solve this problem in a very unique way. Um, the way it handles this is your development environment will be exactly the same as your production environment. The reason for that is because whatever you develop in will be the one that actually gets deployed in production. And I'm going to show you how, that, how you could do that. Um, and <clears throat> and we'll, we'll look at a lot of different features of Docker. Uh, but before we actually get started, um, or before we jump into that, I want to start by answering a very simple question. What is Docker? Um, uh, since this is a technology conference, I presume no one's here thinking it's about Docker, the trousers company, right? Wow, a lot of disappointed faces. Well, uh, <laughs> you put them one leg at a time, and unless you're a Superman, please wear the underwear inside. Uh, <laughs> anyway, I'm just, I'm just kidding. Uh, Docker is an internal project that was started by Dot Cloud um, in 2013. So it's a it's a fairly young project, but uh, it has a very active community around it. I, in fact, the project was so wildly successful, the company actually pivoted and changed their name to Docker Inc. Um, and it's a project that's written in Go. Um, and uh, as I mentioned, it, it has a very uh, active community, which is very welcoming and helpful. Um, this is a definition taken straight out of Docker's website that says, Docker is an open source engine that automates deployment of any application as a lightweight, portable, self-sufficient container that will run virtually anywhere. When they say virtually anywhere, they mean in Linux machines. <laughs> and <laughs> and uh, to make it even complicated, in modern Linux machines with a recent kernel. Uh, but, but apart from that, the definition is actually pretty good. Actually, it's a, it's a fairly accurate description of what Docker does. Um, if you're familiar with chroot or BSD jails and, or Solaris zones, then Docker is a similar technology which provides sandboxing for a process. You al it allows you to run your process in a little sandbox um, that doesn't you know, interact with outside of its container and, uh, and other things. Uh, <coughs> so for this particular sandboxing, it uses Linux containers. And Linux containers have been in the Linux mainline kernel for about five years, I think. Um, so it's a very stable technology that they're using. And Docker is an is a interface on top of that that makes it easy for you to interact with these Linux containers. And in addition to just you know being a um, be sitting on top of Linux containers, it also provides some additional features that makes it easy to use, which is a union file system, uh, which we'll see what it means in a, in a little bit. Um, and you know nice versioning system, kind of like Git, but not quite as powerful, um, and a REST API that allows you to interact with the Docker. Um, 
to contrast this with a with a virtual machine, you have your bare metal on which you run your host operating system, and you know you run VMware or VirtualBox, which is your hypervisor layer, and then you install a full guest operating system inside of that, which is you know Ubuntu or CentOS or anything, and you know multiple libraries and, and Django, and uh, and then you run your app inside of that. Now, if you want to create another one of these instances in a different box, then you have to go through the same process. Even in the same box, you have to go through the same process of actually installing the guest operating system or you know, launching a whole another snapshot of your existing VM, which can be quite expensive and kind of resource hungry. Comparing that to uh, a Docker container, you have your bare metal and your host operating system, which is Linux in this case. Uh, and if you install Docker, then Docker sits as a daemon that runs on your machine. And anytime you launch a container, it gets launched from an image. We'll, we'll get into the terminology definition of what an image is in, in just a minute, but it launches the image, and multiple containers can share the same library because it, it has a read-only layer. As soon as one of these containers starts modifying that library, then it creates a, a uh, separate snapshot of that, and only the diffs, uh, the deltas are stored. So that's the advantage of having the union file system, which allows you to do these copy-on-write um, type, uh, type operation. So containers are very lightweight because they share the kernel with the underlying operating system. It provides you the isolated instance that you'll get from running an actual virtual machine um, because from inside of a container, it looks as if you're inside a VM. But outside of a container, it looks as if you're just another process. It just, you know, it's really that simple. And a VM, even the stripped down bare minimum Linux machine takes at least five seconds if you're really lucky. But a container can start up in under a second, um, sometimes in just milliseconds. So, um, so that's the advantage of, of um, Docker. Now, I'm not going to go into the, to the steps of how to get Docker installed on your machine and get started, because they do a very good job on the documentation on Docker's website. But I just want to briefly touch how I run Docker on OS X, because I keep talking about it, so it uses Linux containers. If you are on a, Lin uh, on a Linux machine, then <coughs> You, when you install Docker, you get two components, the Docker's uh, daemon component and a Docker's client component. And it runs on your host operating system. And your client talks to the Docker daemon, and you, run, you get to you know, launch containers and create images and so on. If you are on OS X like mine, then there is a project called Boot to Docker, which is a very minimal Linux machine, like 25 megabytes, um, that allows you to run Docker. It just has just the bare essentials to get Docker up and running. And uh, there is an OS X client, so what I do is boot to Docker automatically launches itself on a virtual box in which it runs its Linux, and then a Docker daemon runs inside of that. So all the uh, stuff that I'm about to show you will be happening in that particular setup. Um, so I mentioned, so I'm going to introduce a couple of terminologies here, and then we'll, we'll introduce terminology as we keep going. A doc, so I mentioned Docker has two components, the server component and the client component. And the, the server component, which is the daemon, has to run on a Linux machine, and it talks to clients in two ways. One is using a Unix socket if the client happens to be in the same machine, or it, through a TCP socket if the client is on a different machine. Um, from different machines, you can talk to it through the TCP socket. There are clients available for Linux boxes or um, OS X, and you can use them to, to talk to an, a daemon that's running in a, uh, in a separate Linux machine. OK, it's time for a quick demo. <coughs> Let's look at what, uh, what I have here installed. So I have a client version installed, and I have the Docker server version installed. And I want to get started by using a particular image, and I can start playing around with it. Now, if I'm pulling, so what I'm doing here is I'm pulling an image from the registry. Um, again, I'm throwing out some terminology, so I'm going to get back to my slide and explain what those are. An image is a read-only snapshot of your, um, it's a read-only snapshot, and a container is an instantiation of this image. What this means is, say you, you're writing your master's thesis. Um, you spend two years, you put together a, an awesome thesis, you sit there and you type one letter at a time and create your master copy, and you're about to give it to your professor, you're not going to sit there and type out the entire thesis again just to give it to your professor. You're just going to make a photocopy and send it to him. And you can make as many photocopies as you want. And your professor can, in, uh, in turn, make modifications, you know, strike out certain things and uh, do margin notes and highlights and things like that, but that's not going to affect your master copy. And it's not going to affect other professors' copies either. It's completely localized to that professor's copy. 
Um, so this is the idea behind images and containers. So an image is something that you put together, which is kind of like the master copy, where you install all of your libraries and you create your you set your environment variables, add your project files, and do all of your stuff. And when you're ready to run that image, you instantiate a container, which is kind of like instantiating an object from a class. And it gets started and it starts running. Your container might start adding log files or something, but that those log files will be contained inside of that container. It's not going to go back to the image and it's not going to pollute other containers that are running. So this is completely contained um, in, in that container. Anyway, I think I've been that horse to death. Uh, <laughs> so a registry is kind of like uh, the Python package index, where you have a collection of a bunch of different uh, projects that people have pushed. And I'm going to pull a specific image out of this registry and start playing around with it. Now, repositories are just projects in this registry. So if registry is kind of like GitHub, then your repository is your project repo um, kind of thing. And so it's just a collection of images is your repository. OK, so I'm pulling an image um, called base. <coughs> and now if I do Docker images, this lists all the images that I have in my local repository. Even though I pulled a single image, there's four entries here. I, sorry about the, uh, the, the font being too big. But um, it's showing four images. But if you notice, they're, they all have the same image ID. So they're all the sa exactly same images with just different tags. They happen to be named latest Ubuntu, Ubuntu Quantal, and Ubuntu with a Quantal with a typo. Uh, <laughs> so so that's, that's how you list all the images in your, um, in your local registry. Docker ps is a command that you use to look at the containers that are currently running. And since we haven't launched any containers, Docker ps doesn't give us anything. It's, it's empty right now. So let's launch a container. So what I, the way you do that is you say docker run and then give it the image name and then give it a program that you want to run in that container that you're about to launch. So in this case, it was echo hello. Even though the hello got printed in my terminal, it actually ran inside of the container and then it came back. Docker PS still gives me nothing. The reason is because as soon as the process is done, the container's job is over, and so it stopped. And Docker PS will only give me um, containers that are act actively currently running. So let's run something a little bit longer. So I'm going to do a infinite loop. Sorry about that. Uh, OK. OK, that did not work well. OK, so I ran an infinite loop that was printing hello multiple times. And this tied up my terminal because I'm running it in the foreground. You can also run it in the background, which is the, the daemon mode, where you do the same exact command with a dash d option. What that means is it runs the command in a, in a container and puts it in the background. When you run this, it just gives you a SHA ID. So let's see what Docker PS tells us. Docker PS says that there is a container that is currently running with the command that says while true, and it, it's pretty long. And then that's the SHA ID. I'm going to copy that one and run Docker logs on it. Docker logs lets me see what is the STD out that is currently in that container. So this is how you can inspect a, a currently running container to see what it is actually doing. OK, so that's a brief description of images and containers and how you can run them. There's another way that you can run, which is the interactive mode. So the only command here, the, the only change here is I do a dash i and a dash t. So i says I'm running it in interactive mode, and dash t is I'm going to attach my current TTY to this particular uh, container that I'm about to run. In here, when I run ls, I actually get root permission inside of the container. So inside of a container, as I mentioned, it looks exactly like a new, fresh VM. So I have all the whole file system available and, and um, everything for me. But when I run ps, there is nothing running inside of that. Because, the, the, well, the only thing that's running is bash with which I started this particular container. So that's the advantage of, of having a container which can, um, which can have its minimal uh, processes running inside. OK. Um, let's mess around a little bit. So, I'm, so this particular container, I'm modifying a bunch of things inside by installing a couple of um, toy programs. Uh, because, you know, who doesn't like fortune-telling cow? So let's try Let's try that. So I just installed fortune and cow say in my machine, and um, my cow tells me to eat pork. 
That's nice. Um, <laughs> okay, so we saw that I modified certain things inside of the container. I'm going to copy this container shot. It's going to come in handy a little bit later. But again, my Docker PS doesn't show me that the container is running because when I exit out of the container, the container has stopped. But it is not destroyed. It's still just somewhere sleeping. Um, I still have the infinite loop running. I'm going to stop that. Um, so the way you do that is using Docker stop, and, and that is gone. So that's how you stop a running container. If, if, a, if a container goes, um, yeah, keeps, keeps running, then you can just stop it like that. OK, let's get back to something else. So as I mentioned, the container that I messed with does not translate back to the image, the original image, because this is a master copy. To prove, let's start another interactive command and launch it from base. Now if I try fortune, the command is not found. So that was actually localized to only that container. So whatever I modified and app, um, installed, that was in, in that container that I, uh, um, I, I stopped. So as I mentioned, that SHA ID comes in handy because after you've created a container and you've changed a bunch of things inside of it, if you want to create an image out of it because you, know, you brought it to just how you want it, then all you have to do is take the SHA ID, use the commit command, and give it a new name. And now if I run Docker images, I see the fortunate cow <coughs> with a new image ID because files have changed inside. So now if I run fortunate cow and check whether I have my fortune, and I do. I feel like it's mocking me, but, <laughs> but I, I have fortune. So that's how, that's how you can create an image out of an existing container. Um, I'm going to introduce one other command called tag. What this does is it, it creates a tag. It gives a different name for an existing image. To prove that it is the existing image, if you notice that it has the exact same image ID, I just gave it a new name and called it Amjit slash base toys. The reason I put Amjit there is bec uh, there is a reason for that. Because this is how you push to the registry. If you want your image to be available for everyone else to download and use, then you can do that. So this is your registry. This is how the registry looks. You can do container search inside of this and other things. Um, but I think my push is probably done. Yeah, my push is probably done. And if I go in here and look at it, there is the new one that I just pushed. So that's how you can share things with, with people that you, um, that you want to share images. OK, so let's get back to the presentation and get going. So we introduced registries, repositories. We saw a bunch of basic commands, uh, how to pull list images, run PS, logs. You guys know all of this stuff. Um, but those are created by, with, by hand. Like You have to type in one at a time. And if someone else wants to recreate this, I mean, you have to either give them the image or tell them how you created the image in the first place. Uh, whereas Dockerfile allows you to do automate all of this stuff. Here's an example of a Dockerfile. So this says, from the base image. So you're using an, a base image as your starting point. You can use the env to set an environment variable, use add to add local files from your machine into the images, and run a bunch of commands while you're creating this image as a step-by-step -step process. So the apt get update and apt get install will happen automatically. And the cmd command is actually interesting. So every time I do the Docker run, you'll notice that I add a program at the end. If you don't, if you ignore that program, if you completely omit the programs, then this is the default program that will get launched. Um, let's Let's see. Here's the Docker file. And the way you build that is say docker build dash t. Dash t is basically saying I, I want to give it a new name. And Docker file is located in my current folder. I run that. It, it actually installs everything. And now if I run, there we go. So without a command, um, it automatically launches the command that I defined in my Docker file. Okay, 
So so far we've just been looking at you know playing out, playing with Linux toys and things like that. But if you want to run a Django application, you can you can create a Docker file that sets up Django for you inside of that. Add your project files and do all of that sort of things, um, and expose a port. And and you know it'll exposing a port basically means opening a port in your container. Um, do all of that and let's say you launch your container. That as I mentioned, the container is completely isolated. If you open a port 8000 and start listening on that using Django then that 8000 is actually not available to your host machine it's only available for that in that container the way you can map your host machine's port to your container's port is using the dash p uh, dash p option so you just say dash p 8000 colon 8000 then it'll automatically map the container's 8000 with your local machine's 8000 <coughs> So that's networking stuff. There are a couple of other um, quick features that I want to go over, which is volumes allows you to um, mount a volume from your host machine into your container. There are multiple different uh, options that you can do with volumes, like uh, mount volumes between containers and things like that. But uh, for simplicity's sake, I'm just going to keep it um, simple, where you can mount something from your host machine into your container. And anything you write into your container will be available on your host machine. And any changes you make in host will be available on your container. And it allows you to do read-only mounts and, and uh, read-write and all of that stuff. Uh, links is a simple service discovery. So let's say you have a container that's running MySQL and, and a container that's running Django. How is this Django going to know what's the IP address and the port number that's available for it to contact the MySQL? Uh, because every time a new container gets created, a new IP address gets assigned to it, uh, Docker automatically takes care of you know which is the available IP address and it assigns it for you. So the way you do that is you use the dash link option, and that tells you that MySQL's um, IP address and port number will be injected into my, doc, uh, into my Django's container as environment variables. So you just design your Django application to look up these credentials from an environment variable, and you're good to go. Um, I briefly mentioned REST API. You can use it to pull images, get a list of containers. Um, Shipyard is actually a project that a Django project that allows you to do all of the things that I showed in command line from your browser, actually, um, which is actually pretty cool. The way we use it at New Relic, um, if you guys don't know what we do, we uh, you install our software. We do application performance monitoring. So when you install our software on your server, we collect performance metrics and we send them to our server. Now we do this for um, all of these different libraries. Um, actually, I think this is part of it. There's a lot more, but uh, slides don't fit. Um, anyway, trying to in do integration tests would mean like I need a MySQL instance, a Postgres instance, a, a Redis instance, a memcache, different versions of Django, different versions of Flask, and all of these different things. This was getting quite hairy, and our integration tests can only run in Jenkins. It cannot be run in locally. The way we solved that was we put everything inside of a container. And uh, um, you can have different kinds of versions for these different things. MySQL, different versions will have its own containers. Um, and if I made some changes to the Django instrumentation, then I will start a container with Django app inside of it, which automatically has links. So all these different services will be injected in as environment variables. And I just have to go through my integration tests locally. And if I made some changes to Cherry Pie, Flask, whatever it is, all of these can be run locally, and it is all available and ready to go. Um, this actually made our integration tests faster on Jenkins, because now we can run them in parallel since they are completely isolated from each other. Um, so we just wrote some basic, simple bash scripts to get, get this thing going, and it actually works really well. Um, so coming back to the original problem, so how, how would you solve, if you are a full stack developer and things like breaking, thing, uh, breaking changes happen all the time, the way you can solve this is put them in containers. Your MySQL can be in its own container, your application stack in its own different container, and each of your services can be in separate containers. Anytime you make a change, you're making a, your change in a specific container. And since containers are dirt cheap, you can actually run them on your dev machine. It's not like you're starting up a whole VM and like working inside of a, a, a crippled uh, machine or anything like that. And uh, <clears throat> if you want, you can mount your local machine's uh, a folder as your host. Um, as volumes, and it'll be completely available for you. So you can do your development, push it to prod. Well, it's not quite as simple. Um, you probably want to push it to a registry, and then from there you can push it to prod. But you know the registry doesn't have to be the public registry where everyone can see it. I mean, there are private registries like commercial offerings that are available, or um, you can actually host your own private registry locally on your machine. There's like Django, uh, 
Docker registry, just search for it on GitHub and you can find that really easily. Um, there is a really good community. There is um, IRC. Um, Ken Cochran actually is doing a poster session. Very friendly guy. You know, just ask questions to him. Um, I think that pretty much concludes my talk. Um, I think I'm ready for questions now. Thank you, Amjit. If anyone has any questions, please go to the microphone over there. So I'm kind of a shill, but I'll go ahead and throw it out there for you. Uh, <laughs> debugging, how do you go about doing that with Docker? Um, so, so there are different levels of debugging. So the, the logs that I showed are a pretty good example of like some, if something is going wrong inside of it. Now, typically, uh, what we do is we try to run an SSH daemon also in, that, in, in a container. So if something is going wrong and we want to go in and inspect it, we can SSH into the container and start to see what's, what's actually changing. Uh, the other thing that we do is drop down one level, uh, one layer down, where there is a lxc-attach command that's available. So you can do lxc-attach if you don't have SSH running in that container, because you want to keep your container absolutely minimal. Um, uh, but you could still do lxc-attach, and it puts you in an interactive mode in that container, and you can um, start messing around with the log files, take a look at it, and see um, what, what's actually going on. So those are some of the tips that I have. If you need to have a different configuration for your production environment, like say you want to turn off debugging and have different, you know, maybe you have replicated servers in production. If you're using the same image on development and production, how do you account for the differences between those two environments? So that's a very good question. So I forgot to mention that there is a staging environment that is involved in, in our actual production deployment. So we not only use it for integration testing, we actually use it in some parts of our production. Although Docker tells us not to use it till 1.0 is you know reached, uh, but you know we like living on the edge. Anyway, <laughs> um, the way we do that is your staging environment should be uh, very very closely replicated with your production environment. And the way we do this um, is after we we create our images, we push it to our Jenkins server, and our Jenkins server actually changes all the environment variables according to how the production environment should be set up, and then it runs all its integration tests on that exact image. So whatever the image is will be the one that actually gets deployed eventually. So we run all of our tests um, with how the, the containers will be, and um, we just ship them. So I don't know if that helped. Can Docker be used to run untrusted code in a safe manner, as a sandbox? Uh, yeah, I think that was the intention for Docker. So the way it, I mean, it is a complete sand, uh, a sandbox environment. So you can run something. And um, there are a couple of features that I kind of left out, which is you can restrict how much memory that the container can consume. And uh, I don't know if CPU can be restricted. That's something you can look up on the documentation. But you can, in fact, you know, run your fork bomb inside and see if it'll uh, if it'll bring down the host or not. I'll try it. <laughs> Hi, yeah, we're uh, we're a Python shop and we're using uh, Docker in production um, on the edge, as you say. Yes. Yeah, <laughs> but uh, we're still trying to figure out the best way to uh, deploy like requirements files with pip. They go in the Docker file or leave them in a volume and relationship between, you know, like our Mercurial repository and, and virtual environments. We don't really need virtual environments anymore with Docker, but do you have any suggestions for best practices on moving from traditional virtual environment and PIP requirements and checking out the latest for development versus doing that in Docker? Um, we still use virtual environments, actually, uh, because it's just easier to do. Well, I guess you don't need virtual environments in order to do pip-r requirements.txt, but uh, we just still have it in our um, environment. But the so we actually do it at the image creation step. We don't do it inside of the container, like after the container has launched, so that you know the deploy process is literally just take um, move the image into the production system and then like you know launch a container out of it. So that happens at the build step. And um, so yeah, we still have our uh, have our um, requirements as part of the re repository, and then that repository as a whole gets added into the image, and then we run a bunch of different tests uh, steps to set up the image and finally create the container out of it. Thanks. I'm sorry, we only have time for one more question. 
Uh, not really a question. Uh, Docker does support CPU shares, and I would recommend checking out FIG. It's a pip installable thing for uh, really good for a local dev environment. Cool. Thank you. Uh, we run out of time. Thank you very much. Uh, we can for MJIT and. Uh, thank you.